Welcome to Maximal Being, a podcast devoted to ditching fad diets and using real science to get you healthy and feeling great. I'm Doc Mock, a GI and functional medicine doctor who harnesses the power of gut health to get you achieving your goals. And I'm Jackie P, a well-informed layman who challenges the experts and asks the questions that you want. Don't forget to hit the subscribe button or leave a comment. And now, on to the show. Paul, I have a question. So do you, is your vision or your goal to come to completely replace, you know, you know, animal, you know, traditional animal proteins in, you know, the, the diet of the country, or is, is your vision something to be more of a, uh, you know, compromise, right? Because you, sure. you mentioned before about the environmental impacts, right? Um, what, what would you see if everything worked out the way you wanted, how would the folks across the country and the world would be eating and consuming protein? Sure. Well, uh, I'm going to answer your question directly. And let me first just say though, you know, 150 years later, you know, we still have some whaling in the world, uh, you know, more than hundred years after the car was introduced, we still have some horse drawn carriages in the world. I don't believe that raising and slaughtering animals is going to go away but it is going to be a far lower portion of the meat that people are eating. In the past, we have thought about meat as largely a hunk of flesh from a once living animal's body. That's how we have defined meat. In the future, it will be a far more diverse view of what constitutes meat. Yes, we will still have slaughtered animals, but we are also gonna have a lot more meat coming from plant protein from microbial fermentation and by cultivating actual animal cells. And so we're gonna have a far more diverse and interesting type of meat industry. And so, you know, put it this way, like if you think about the film wars of the 1990s, you had Kodak and you had Canon and they're vying for supremacy in the film market. Well, Kodak and Canon both knew about digital, but Kodak was concerned it was gonna cannibalize its core business. And Canon thought it will cannibalize our business of selling negatives and print film and one hour photo and everything else. But we think it's the future. And so they invested in it. And we all know what happened in the end. Kodak went bankrupt and Canon is now the largest manufacturer of digital cameras on the planet. And it doesn't mean that we don't have print photography anymore, but it does mean that we do still have photography, but it's different. We still use photos for the same reason, to capture our memories. It's still the same thing. It's just a way more efficient way to get them now. This is why 99% of photos are now digital, because it's just dramatically more convenient for us to take digital photos than print photos. Well, I think that's what's gonna happen with meat, that it's gonna become so much more efficient to produce these other non-animal kinds of meat that people will just naturally switch. They will think in the same way that you would never consider taking a print photo today, or you would never consider going to the video store to rent a, a DVD. Um, you know, people are just gonna switch and we'll have better meat that will be more efficient, more cost-effective and way better for the planet. So no, I don't think that you're gonna see the total annihilation of any one of these sectors, but I do think that efficiency gains are gonna make these non-animal sectors win out in general. Interesting. That's you have, I have to say, very fantastic metaphors. I have to say it. It's just you paint the picture perfectly, especially for the laymen out there and women out there like me. Paleo, keto, vegan, and carnivore. Maybe you've tried them all, but did you have success? Are you still doing that diet? Turns out there's not just one diet right for one particular person. By understanding how your body works and the relationship behind your body's workings and these diets, you can then approach the perfect plan for you. In the Perfect Human Diet course, we talk to you about your body's inner workings and the pros and cons of each plan. We discuss how our ancestors ate and have eaten and lay a framework to tailoring a plan that is perfect for you. To learn more about the Perfect Human Diet course, head to MaximalBeing.com slash courses to find out more. And as always, I'm Doc Mock, and I'm here to maximize your health. You cannot supplement your way to health, but there are things that we need to add to our lives that can maximize our pathway to wellness. The American diet is virtually devoid of omega-3 fatty acids, which play a major role in cardiovascular disease, gut permeability, and mental health. Personally, 
I take omega-3s every night and iHerb is the best place for clean natural sources of supplements. I love the Zenwise Omega-3 Fatty Acid Supplement, which is free of fish burps and good for the environment. Head on over to MaximalBeing.com slash iHerb, that's I-H-E-R-B, and enter the code B as in boy, D as in dog, B as in boy, 5528, and receive 10% off your orders for all supplements. Maximize your supplements with iHerb. How do you see this from a, I guess, from a more, uh, I guess, globe application, right? I know I, I was reading some material about, you know, you said it's going to be more efficient, right? There are places in, in, in this world that, you know, it's hard to get nutritious food out to. Um, are there other applications, right, other than sustainability uh, that you see this being a positive influence? Yeah, it's a great question, Jackie. So, you know, think about it, like imagine a lot of uh, landlocked places where they don't have access to fish, right? They don't, they don't have the ability to fish or areas where they're under drought and so their wakes have dried up and they don't have access to fish. Well, imagine if we could set up shop, a cultivation or a fermentation facility where we can just create that fish experience without the need to take fish out of the ocean. Uh, we could create a truly local market for those populations where they could have fresh local fish without the need to go all the way out to the coast and try to uh, fish the increasingly depleted oceans of fish. I also think there's a lot of really interesting applications that you could have out there. So for example, imagine like if you go to your friend's house and you know she's got on her kitchen counter a bread maker or an ice cream maker, that's cool. It's a cool device, but it's not really remarkable. You're not going to be like, oh my God, look at me, you got an ice cream maker. Well, what if she had a meat maker? You know, what if there was like a tabletop device and you just ordered tea bags full of stem cells and you could drop them in and you could make meat right in your own kitchen? That would be pretty awesome. Or imagine that you could go to a bar and instead of brewing their own IPA, they're brewing their own meat. Or maybe even they have a pig in the back who's living out there contentedly and you're eating a sausage made of that pig's cells and you, you know, tip, go out and tip your hat to the pig who's merrily rooting around in the back. Um, or imagine you know, a turducken. So for those of you not familiar, turducken is like a chicken stuffed inside of a duck, stuffed inside of a turkey. Well, imagine if instead of like crudely stuffing one bird inside of another inside of another, you could actually grow chicken, duck, and turkey cells and interweave them together so they're you know, molecularly combined. You know, the point is that you could enjoy a, a culinary experience that's totally novel to humanity that no one has ever eaten before. And this is already happening. So as one example, uh, there's a company called Geltor and they made, uh, they, they took, so the mastodon is like this elephant-like animal who went extinct in North America about the same time that humans arrived here, presumably because we hunted them to extinction. But, you know, there still are mastodons who are uncovered in icy graves who still live thousands of years later. They live on in, in you know, because we've sequenced their genome. Uh, they're dead, but we've sequenced their genome. Well, this startup called Geltor actually took that sequence and they printed out mastodon collagen and made gelatin from it and made gummy candies. They didn't make gummy bears. They made gummy elephants and they ate them. And so they ate actual mastodon protein, like the first humans to have eaten mastodon protein in many millennia. And they did it. I mean, that's pretty badass, right? Like that's pretty totally. unbelievable. And so, you know, I, I actually think of this um, animal free protein revolution as a way, not just to save the planet, not just to prevent animal suffering, not just to improve human health, but to actually offer really interesting and novel culinary experiences that people just haven't had before. It's kind of like, you know, if you think about cheese, you know, so if you think about like the time between when humans domesticated cows, but before anybody learned how to make milk curdle. So people were drinking cow's milk, but they weren't eating cheese. They didn't know how. Nobody at that time had ever dreamt of brie or gouda or Swiss or cheddar. They, they never even heard of it. They never thought about it. But now these are core culinary experiences that most people wouldn't want to do without. And imagine what other culinary experiences await us that we have never dreamt of. Like what is the brie or the gouda of the future for us that we have never dreamt of because nobody's invented that new food yet. Cheese is a pretty novel food on the time scale of humanity. I think that through things like cellular agriculture and microbial fermentation, we're going to be able to create, <coughs> excuse me, really awesome culinary experiences that nobody's dreamt of. 
I, I also see applications for our soldiers, right? You're in combat, you're in an isolated part of the world, you're, you know, setting up a whole new environment there. It's difficult. You're bringing in these, you know, freeze dried, terribly unnutritious foods that are high in carbohydrate, have no protein in them. Say you bring your 3D printer and you print yourself a steak and you have a steak dinner out there in the field. That's pretty amazing. Sounds fun. Uh, I'm going to enlist just hearing you tell the story, Doc. I'm, I'm... <laughs> Who doesn't love some burpees, right? Oh, <laughs> a good burpee. Oh, if, I, yeah. if I had calves like yours, I wouldn't mind. But uh, sadly, <laughs> I'm, a, I'm, I'm a mere mortal, so it takes a lot of energy. Guy. Yeah, guy. Leg legend has it that he has to consume three times the amount of protein just to feed his, his calf muscles. <laughs> right, yeah, that's, that's true. Yeah. Gosh, I hope I'm not responsible yeah, yeah. for all the environmental things that are happening. Yeah. Like, yeah. <laughs> so, um, you know, Paul, it sounds like a magic bullet, right? It sounds like there are so many widespread applications, um, so many positive side effects. And what, what are, if any, like what, what's the downside? What is the trade-off, right? It, you know, is there, is there, you know, something that it, we're leaving on the table, whether it's nutritiously or like, you know, is this something that's just more, ex, you know, more expensive? I don't know. You know, what, what is the, 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 the downside to, uh, to this? Yeah, I think the biggest concern is really what happens in the economy, because this creates a new industry, with, which creates lots of new jobs. But it also, you know, really reduces the need for the raising and slaughtering of animals. And so there's a lot of people involved in that industry. It's kind of like, you know, like actually to use the example I gave earlier about horses, like, you know, there were lots of people who manufactured the whips, who manufactured the saddles, who manufactured the spurs, the, the, the you know, the uh, carriages and so on. Um, and what happened to them when the car was invented? You know, those, those people didn't have jobs anymore. Uh, you know, similarly, you know, what happened to all the people working at Blockbuster? Um, you know, we, you know, we don't really shed tears for them when we're streaming Squid Game. But, <laughs> you know, we are, you know, those people lost their jobs. I mean, the whole industries were really devastated. And so there's a similar thing that can happen here. And I think the key is going to be to figure out ways to help people enter the new agricultural economy to help train people to grow the types of crops that are needed, for example, for microbial fermentation. You know, these, the, the fermentations don't run on nothing. You still need to feed the crops into the system. So, you know, you, you just have to retrain though. Uh, you know, there's an interesting article I read not that long ago about how with Americans continually reducing their tobacco use, um, you know, one of the king, one of the big crops that we've grown for hundreds of years here is no longer in need. And interestingly, there's a correlation, not causal, but an interesting correlation between reducing capital or reducing demand for tobacco and increasing demand in the United States for hummus. So and I'm not saying it's a causal correlation, but as tobacco, as tobacco demand has decreased, hummus demand has skyrocketed. And so there have actually been programs in places like North Carolina to retrain tobacco growers to grow chickpeas. Uh, because we need, you know, we need a lot more chickpeas now than we did before, because we're eating a lot of hummus, <laughs> uh, which to me is great. Like that's, you know, less tobacco, more hummus. That's a great world to live in. I, I would be thrilled to live in that world. So um, anyway, the point is like, that's the downside, I think, Jackie, which is how do you retrain the agricultural workforce that is accustomed to killing animals to do something else? And that's going to be a challenge. I also think that, you know, nutritionally, maybe with the exception of microbial fermentation as a vehicle, a lot of these products are lacking in B12, right? Because B12 is generated in meat products, not necessarily in plant-based products. And it's through the interaction of that meat product with our own microbiome that that occurs, right? Or, or the microbiome of the animal. And so when you're growing these animal cells or plant cells in a sterile environment, they don't have an ability to interact with the bacteria uh, to generate B12 and therefore are lacking in B12. But I would imagine if you have a microbial medium involved that you're able to input B12. Yeah, that's right, Doc Mock. So first of all, everything you're saying is spot on. And um, so you're right on um, microbial fermentation. It's less of a concern. Um, but yeah, I mean, these foods should be um, fortified. 
with cyanocobalamin, and uh, that way, you know, you get the B12 that you're seeking in there. So you, know, you can make better meat, right? So you, you can make meat that has less saturated fat and, and so on, but you don't want to lose out on the good parts of it, which are things like B12. Um, and so I, I actually advocate for, um, for B12 fortification for a lot of these foods. But it's important not just for people who aren't eating animal meat. I mean, even pretty much anybody over 50 has a real risk of being B12 deficient. And so that's why in countries with older populations, like if you, if you look at Israel, for example, where they have a lot of older people, in the same way that we mandate by law that our bread has to be fortified with folate here in the United States, they mandate that bread has to be fortified with B12. And so I like, guess kind of an interesting look, and that's not because people aren't eating meat, it's just because they have an elderly population. And so I'm actually a proponent of B12 uh, fortification for most people. I, I take a B12 supplement a couple of times a week and uh, whether I eat meat or don't eat meat, I, I would not change anything. Do you take it under the tongue or a pill or an injection or? Uh, no, I do a sublingual one because I read that the sublingual ones are better absorbed. Um, yeah. But um, uh, an injection, you know, uh, you know, I already got my COVID shots, man. That's enough injections for me. I don't, want, <laughs> I don't want any more injections. I even got my booster on and I'm, I'm, That's I'm good. Great. I'm good yeah. to go for it right now. For the listeners and, and Jackie P, you know, stop me if I'm getting way too much in the nerd weeds here. But um, B12 is so complicated to get into your circulation. You have to first get enough in your diet, which again, usually comes from, from meat. It goes into the stomach. You have to have acid in your stomach to digest it. So people that block their acid or don't make acid through atrophic gastropathy, they're not able to break down B12. You need to have a working pancreas. You have to have a happy microbiome, both to be able to digest it, add some stuff. And then you also have to have the end part of the small bowel there, which some people don't, called the ileum, where it's absorbed. That's a lot of steps that can go wrong for one little molecule. <laughs> it's amazing that we survived this long. You know? I know. Absolutely. <laughs> it's a miracle. <laughs> yeah. I, I have one question and this is minor. I don't know. Um, before our break, what, what is the answer Paul to the diversity of meat? Right. Cause there's, you know, you mentioned seafood and right. There's chicken, there's steak, there's pork, there's, you know, you know, squid, right? You know, what is what is the answer if there is one to just having the different textures of meat? Yeah, yeah you you would uh, be wise and 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 well informed to come work at one of these companies, Jackie P, because you'll you'll be psyched to learn about it. It's a fascinating science, but you can affect the texture. So keep in mind, like what's you know, think about the different texture. Let's just say between a crab cake and a steak, right? Those are two very different textures. A steak is going to be, you know, uh, much tighter, uh, like a whole muscle, whereas the crab cake is kind of a looser conglomeration of chunks of this lumpy meat, right? And we can do that. Uh, at the Better Meat Co., we do that regularly. We do create different textures for different types of meat, and you do that both through uh, hydration ratios, like how much water are you adding to the product. You can do it through the addition of uh, certain types of plant fibers that you can add that have different types. So for example, bamboo fiber or psyllium husk. So Doc Mock will be familiar with psyllium, psyllium husk because it's like basically the main ingredient in Metamucil, which I'm sure a lot of its patients take. Um, but you know, interestingly, you can use that um, as an ingredient to alter the texture of a product as well. And so that's the key is like basically hydration and which types of fibers and what ratios you're using. It's, it's, it's a science. I like that you use natural forms of additives, right? Because one of the areas that I couldn't find in my literature search in preparation for our discussion with you today, there's a lot on the environmental impact and palatability and some of these issues with, you know, how our bodies deal with different proteins, but there wasn't a lot on the impact of the microbiome, which is such a hot topic in my field. And food additives and colorings and all of these things greatly impact the microbiome. That data is there. So I would love to see in the future, you know, the impact of products, you know, like your, yours, that, that how they impact our microbiome and do they, they impact it in the positive manner that we see because they have things like fiber, you know, I, I would love to see that data. Yeah. Yeah. That would be really cool. I would love to see that too, but I'm a big proponent of fiber consumption. In fact, I believe that the RDA in the United States is too low. 
which yeah. is you know pretty remarkable because nine out of ten people aren't hitting that low RDA, twenty five grams per person per day, and even then people aren't getting it. But it should be higher. You know, in fact, if you look at studies of like fossilized feces from our ancestors from you know thousands of years ago. These are people who look like they're probably getting like 75, 100 grams a day. I mean, that's, you know, it, it, it madness from compared to what we do, but they're eating a lot of whole plant foods. And so that is the diet that humanity, you know, grew up on, so to speak. And now we eat a diet that is ultra processed and high in meat. And so you don't get a lot of fiber because even when you're eating plant foods, you're eating things like white rice, white bread, white pasta, and so on. Um, whereas if we would eat whole foods like brown rice or whole wheat and so on, um, along with beans and lentils and nuts and seeds and so on, you end up getting a lot of fiber and you'll feel better. You, you really will feel better. So uh, I'm a big proponent. I, I, I just think the, the future should be fiber fueled. Yeah, I, I think the United States is way behind, you know, 20 grams of fiber is a low point. Europe's slightly better at 30, but, you know, Jackie P and I were both eating around 50 to 60 grams every single wow. day. Wow, so, wow. And that's, is that all through food or are you taking fiber supplements? Are you getting yeah, up all, food? all through food and, and my, the wow. fiber supplements that I reach for for my patients are things like citrus pectin and inulin that also have, yeah. you know, pre and some postbiotic effects as well. So, you know, nice. added wow. So you must be eating a, a you know a very plant centric diet to, to absolutely get to yeah we both diet. do and and that's the diet that we preach for here at Maximal Being so I'm giving you guys a fist bump yeah. on your fiber here really a uh, an, an impressive uh, an impressive feat yeah you got to practice what you preach as a doctor yes <laughs> nice you got to eat what you preach very nice exactly. Yep. Yeah. All right. All right. Well, listen, we've been talking with Paul Shapiro about a myriad of amazing things, but mostly, you know, sustainable, right, food sources and, and microbial, my, was it microbial fermentation, right? Uh, we're going to take a quick break and we will see you all or speak to you all very shortly. What's going on, Maximal Beings? It's Doc Mock here. Many of you are returning to the gym now but some are not going back. Regardless of what you plan, Rogue has got the right gear to fit your needs. I personally own a barbell set and love it. The black op shorts are sweat resistant and flexible for getting deep in your squats. Head on over to maximalbeing.com rogue for our referral link. Order three items and they ship for free. And as usual, it's Doc Mock and I'm here to maximize your pathway to wellness. If you're stuck at home and cannot make it to the grocery store, delivery may be the best way to stay clean and healthy. Instacart is the national leader in the direct to home delivery service. With numerous major chains and food from smaller stores, you can get those local veggies sent directly to your doorstep. Head on over to maximalbeing.com slash Instacart and maximize your nutrition today. Welcome back, Maximal Beans. It is I, Jackie P., your layman. Of course, my co-hostess with the Moses, Doc Mock. And we've been speaking with Paul Shapiro about all types of, I feel, futuristic topics. I mean, just being able to grow meat and protein in your kitchen like a bread maker is something right out of the Jetsons. And honestly, I'm excited for it. Mm. Um and, you know, we have the three questions, Paul, that we ask all of our, our guests. Um, but before, anything to add? I see. Anna. Yes, I, I do. I just have to tell a quick amusing anecdote. So, uh, you know, you, you are uh, correctly pointing out, Jackie P., the Jetsons analogy here. And in fact, that is how the Jetsons made their food. They had like a little replicator, kind of like on Star Trek, uh, where they just could make their food right there. And, you know, that is really comparable to what we are doing at places like the Better Meat Co. Um, but I'll tell you a funny story. So in my book, Clean Meat, I talk about the Jetsons and I talk about how this is like turning their, the writers of that show, in their fantasies into reality. However, there's a lot of foreign editions of the book Clean Meat and the Jetsons are not universally known. And so in many of the foreign editions, the uh, publishers have, have changed that part of the book to talk about other like local sci-fi shows that their cultures would know about. So it's kind of cool that we say the Jetsons and we know what we're reading in the United States, but it turns out not everybody around the world knows the Jetsons. Uh, so wow. 
other sci fi but it, but it is it is kind of like a universal thing in sci fi that they believe that in the future we're not going to be raising and slaughtering animals. And in fact, you know, why would we? If we're traveling space, you know, we're not going to be bringing Noah's Ark in tow. You know, <laughs> like, you know, it takes a lot, it takes a lot to maintain life in space. You know, really, you're going to have machines that through fermentation or other types of um, uh, cell culture are going to produce the protein that we want. Amazing. That is really cool. I never even thought about that. That, you know, of course, Jetsons isn't across the world. So, of course, other folks are going to have their own local TV shows. And I wonder yeah. how many of them were knockoffs of the Jetsons. But, you know, that's a <laughs> conversation Probably. for another time, right? <laughs> Probably many. Include that in the show notes. Let's look it up. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> All right. So, first question, Paul. What is your favorite exercise? Uh, I love sprinting. And so I do a lot of hundred meters. I'm 42 years old. And so my hundred meter is not good. It's about 14 seconds. So I'm not that proud of it, but you know, I do think for a 42 year old, I might be in the, you know, an upper percentile, uh, on that, but you know, I do, I do a lot of like running and short distance running. I'm proud to say, uh, this morning I ran a, a 604 mile. Um, so for 42 wow. year old men to be able to do a 604 mile and, and uh, a few months ago, I did a 558. So, you know, to be able to run like a six minute mile, I, that's got to put me in like the top one percentile of 42 year old American men, I think. So yeah. uh, I, I do a lot of running and, uh, but short distances, I used to do long distance, uh, like at the marathon level. And I, I just found it to be kind of like calorically wasteful, you know, <laughs> you got to eat a lot. <laughs> You got to eat a lot to maintain that type of lifestyle. And I didn't want to eat yep. that much. So, uh, so now I'm doing, really like, do. yeah, yeah, yeah. So anyway, yeah. So, uh, I, I'm, I'm into like sprinting and more short distance stuff. Well, well, one congratulations for a 558 because yeah. I don't think I've ever ran a mile anywhere in the arena of that time. <laughs> so I know to you, you feel like that's lacking, but that's an yeah. incredible feat. And also the fact that you're still moving um is is also fantastic because there's you know mm -hmm. a lot of folks who aren't moving like that anymore so yeah no, uh, that's I'm, incredible I'm good i want to be like george foreman you know like george foreman <laughs> came, back, came back and fought in mender holyfield when he was like in his mid-40s or something yeah and you know i figure that, that's gonna be like me that, that's my yeah. hero right there just yeah. goes to show you paul it's not the size of the calves it's how you use them right <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, that's that old accent. My grandmother always said that. It's yeah. <laughs> <laughs> All right. So sprinting, yes, I like sprints as well. Fast twitch muscles, you know. Shout out to the sprinters out there. Um, okay, so what is your favorite health book and why? Uh, I actually read a good number of health books, and I have a number one favorite one uh, by far, which is How Not to Die by Michael Greger. And it's a fantastic book in which Dr. Greger looks at all the top ways that uh, you're likely to die. So he goes through what are, like all the top reasons that people die in, in America. And of course, heart disease is number one, but he goes through all the various cancers and so on. And he just goes through them. And then each chapter is what has been proven by the literature to reduce your risk of that. And so if you're concerned about breast cancer, you're concerned about colon cancer, you're concerned about heart disease, whatever the case may be, you can read that chapter and say, these are what are proven to reduce my risk of developing this. It doesn't say you're going to live forever. It doesn't say you're not going to get it. It just says, this is what will reduce your risk. And it's, it, it, I really like it because it's, he doesn't have an ideological ax to grind about any type of diet. He just follows what's really like an evidence-based diet. That's it. And when the evidence changes, he changes, which I really admire. I've watched interviews of him where he said, oh yeah, this these studies used to say this, and now they say this, so we've updated our recommendations, which is what a real scientist should do. So I recommend How Not to Die. It's a great book by Michael Greger, and uh, I think that everybody I've recommended it to has thanked me for it. That's that sounds one. that sounds really cool. One, it's a fantastic title. And yeah. I, I can't even imagine how many times Omega-3 is mentioned in that book. Yeah. Oh yeah, yeah. He's a big proponent of DHA. He 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 recommends uh, DHA supplementation. It's a yep. it's a nutritional superhero. Actually, yeah. we're gonna we're gonna start writing comic books about it. <laughs> All right. <laughs> um, and last but not least, what is the craziest diet you've heard of or been on? 
Well, those are two very different questions because there's a lot of crazy ones I've heard of. I mean, this new carnivore diet is insane where people literally eat only meat. I mean, that is just a great way to accelerate your, your time to the grave. <laughs> um, but I've never done that, thankfully. But uh, what, the craziest thing that I've done um, was a seven day water only fast. So I, um, I did a pretty long intermittent fast, I guess it was intermittent yeah. for a period of a month. Um, but I, I didn't eat anything for seven days. And I, I did it because I read this doctor named Joel Furman's book. He has a book called uh, Fasting and Eating for Health. And I, I don't know that I think it was a good idea. Uh, I did it. I, I you know, I'm, I'm not saying it didn't do anything, but you know, I lost like 14 pounds and I didn't want to, like, I, of course I, I wasn't overweight, so it wasn't like, you know, I was trying to lose weight or anything, but, um, I believed at that time, at least that it was healthy to fast for that long based on this book that I had read. And so I did it, whether it helped me or not, I have no idea, but I did do it. And that is by far the craziest thing. And both my mom and my wife have told me if I ever do that again, they are disowning me. I mean, you must be so hangry during that time period. I can't even like, you, you stop, you stop being hungry you, you, pretty quickly. Like after a day or so, you really stop being hungry. But what yeah. you realize is that you eat socially, like your day is broken up and you have mm-hmm. PC and it just is very discombobulating to yeah. have no break and no, you know, get off of your game like that. So I, I wouldn't do it again, honestly, but yeah, I did do it. Yeah. We don't, when we advocate for time restricted eating or intermittent fasting, whatever you want to call it, you know, we, you have to have something else with it. You need some sort of electrolyte, you know, the, the longest fasting record is 382 days. That guy had bone broth and he had electrolyte solutions and he had a physician watching him the entire time. You know, you need something else. I I think. Yeah. Yeah, I I had water and nothing else. I didn't have anybody watching or anything. I just did water. Yeah. 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 Stupid me. Let him learn. But I mean, it's, it's worth, it's all about self-experimentation and seeing what works and yeah. what, what doesn't work for you as an individual. You know, I think that's, that right. that's the most important thing. Well, yeah. this has been an amazing discussion, Paul, you know, thanks so much for coming on. I, I applaud your company for, you know, the ability to think forward and think of all of these potential future applications for protein. You know, we discussed the importance of having fiber and protein in the same vehicle, all the limitations of, you know, animal proteins and the environmental impact and the cost impact on our society. I think that this was an amazing overview. So thank you so much. We really appreciate you. Doc Ma, Jackie P, my respect goes out to you. Thanks so much. I'm going to try to get my 50 grams of fiber on tomorrow. We'll see if I can meet your standard here. (laughs) Sounds good. And where can people find you if they want to reach out and ask questions? Uh, That's very nice of you. So you can go to bettermeat.co. Again, that's bettermeat.co and get in touch with me there. If you're interested in reading my book, Clean Meat, you can buy it anywhere books are sold. Again, it's called Clean Meat, How Growing Meat Without Animals Will Revolutionize Dinner and the World. And you can buy that anywhere, Amazon or anywhere else. But if you want to go to the book's official website, it's just cleanmeat.com. Yeah, it's an amazing read. And for all of you out there that have questions for us, email us at team at maximalbeing.com. Don't forget to hit the subscribe button. Leave us a comment. It really does help us get the word out. Our new meal prep boot camp uh, doesn't have clean meats in there, but maybe you should add it is out. So check that out at maximalbeing.com. And as always, I'm Doc Mock here with Jackie P and Mr. Paul Shapiro saying we're here to maximize your health. What's going on, Maximal Beings? Doc Mock here. If you haven't done so already, leave us a comment and hit the subscribe button. Let your friends and family know. That way we can get the word out and continue to bash the bro science.